I want you to look with me at 1 Timothy. The fact is that I wanted to have this gathering for the sake of leadership and I, th I th think that we're acquainted with 1 Timothy when we think of qualifications for leadership. And uh, of course, 1 Timothy and Titus are typically the place that we would go. And, you know, we can think about what, what are the qualities that make up somebody that, that we would want to put into leadership. And in, in 1 Timothy 3, it's spelled out for us. We know that the man needs to aspire. He needs to be above reproach, husband of one wife, sober. And you, and you know these, not a drunkard. The fact is that that everything except for one item has to do with character, has to do with the moral aspect of the man. And I oftentimes, when I'm thinking about the qualifications, if, if I were to ask somebody, usually they can think through 1 Timothy, they can think through Titus. But there is a quality. There is a qualification that comes up in 2 Timothy. And often people don't think necessarily about this one. It's in 2 Timothy chapter 2. Paul says in 2 Timothy 2, You then, my child, he's speaking to Timothy, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And what you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses and trust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. It's that faithful. I, I, you know, when, when I was um, young, newly saved, strongly influenced by John MacArthur, I began praying that God would take me somewhere. Very interesting, God took me to Texas. I, I look back at times and I wondered, why did God take me to Texas and not to L.A. where John MacArthur was? He's the one that had so much influence. He's the one God used to save me. Why did I end up under Pat Horner in, in San Antonio, Texas? And you know, I think it was because Pat was very uniquely... Uh, he pastored, but he also had a real burden for missions, and he was a church planter. And that is, I mean, basically what Pat did was what eventually I found God doing with me. And what happens is when you're, when you're thinking missions and when you're thinking about church planting, and we worked church plants in various countries, and uh, some some right there in uh, in Texas. We were involved in one up in Maine. And uh, over the years, what, what that has, what that is involved is me getting involved with going to these churches and trying to identify potential leaders and then also raising up leaders in the home church and you know raising up people for for different things guys were coming along all the time for different ministries and we sent out guys as pastors in church plants we sent people to the foreign field as missionaries uh, guys have been raised up in our own church as as deacons and elders and and so i can tell you this i, I don't know how many you know obviously there's been any number of men. We, we've had a number of men that I was really hopeful would end up uh, being sent out or being leaders somewhere, and it, it didn't pan out. And with 
With others, it did. And with some men, I recognized, I mean, there's some men that I recognized that I, I believe were qualified for things. And for one reason or another, they never, they, they just didn't end up where I would have liked to have seen them. There were other men that I looked at and I recognized, no, I, you know, I, they're not ready. And, and sometimes you recognize they'll probably never be ready. You never know what God can do in the future. But having to evaluate all the time and evaluate through scriptural lens, I can, let me just tell you this. I recognized really early that faithfulness is just about the most important aspect. And I know you can look at, well, then they have to be saved. Yes, obviously that's the starting point. But when it comes to men who claim to be Christians, women too, I mean, in, in their place for, for how uh, women would be evaluated for certain things, but faithfulness, faithfulness, Anyways, I, I, I want to talk about this before we before we dive in Verdine's book, because I, I, what you guys really want to pay close attention to. I mean, look at it there. Faithful men entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach. And I, I recognize what he's entrusting there is what you've heard from me in the presence of many witnesses. This is the idea of a faithfulness that has to go along with, with the imparting of the gospel, undoubtedly. But this aspect, he's obviously what he's doing is he's training men. He's training men for something. And let's just think about the word faithful. If like I, I, when I worked as an engineer, the boss, you, you know how this can be in a workplace. The boss all of a sudden breaks through a door. What's he find? Some people not working. If he finds a bunch of people over there at the water cooler and they're standing around and they're talking. And all of a sudden he comes through the door and they immediately move away from there. Like, like they just realized, you know, oh, they've been caught staying around doing nothing and they should be working. That's one thing if you come through the door and they all continue to stand there because it's like break time or something. But the very fact that all of a sudden, you know, it's kind of like a police officer driving down the road and the guy that throws the brakes on, well, you know, guilty, he, he realizes. But you know that when the boss walks through the door and he sees somebody standing around, I can remember this. When I worked for John Seitzma, John actually had me come to San Antonio and work for him. That's how I ended up making the move from Michigan. I had met John. He offered me a job. I can remember he hired this guy. And the guy didn't realize I, I, I was standing outside his window. And I don't know if there was a glare a certain way or if I was at a certain angle, but I can remember he was sitting there reading the paper when he really should have been working. And then here comes John's son. And as soon as he saw John's son coming, he jumped up and I watched him and he went over and he was monkeying with the machinery like he was actually doing something, but he wasn't doing anything. And you know what? When What's really interesting about this guy is this was the brother-in-law to the pastor of the church I was in. And in the course of time, he came up as a possible pastor for a church plant. I resisted it. Now, Pat went ahead and put him in there. But you know what? The work Eventually, the work fell apart, and this guy was out of the ministry. And But you know what? Just seeing that... Seeing him act that part, seeing him jump when he saw Johnny Seitzma coming and then run over to the machines like he was actually doing something. And I, and I watched that and that right there told me that man's not qualified. 
And so when Pat brought him up, I, I, I resisted, I resist. And you know what the proof, I, think about what faithful means. What is faithful? What's the idea behind it? Trustworthy. Trustworthy. Yeah, somebody, it's somebody that's loyal to the cause. It's somebody trustworthy. It's somebody that can be depended on. I can remember this. A guy came to the church and he, uh, he was leading music. And you know what? One Sunday, he just didn't. It's like when it was his time to go up there, he just sat over there. And I mean, you know, here, here we are in the middle of the service and, you know, well, I, I'm just going to take over at that point in time and make it happen. But right there, that, that man was massively discredited in my mind. Why? He wasn't faithful. And it, you know what? Some men will be faithful as long as somebody's watching them. As long as they think they're being watched, as long as they're in front of the crowd, they like the attention, they like to be in front of the crowd, but you know what? You get them on the side. You want the guy that, you know what? He'll go mow the lawn and he's faithful to do it. He'll, he'll carry it out. He's dependable. He's committed. This is what scripture says. His master said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been Faithful over a little, I will set you over much. You know what I'm watching for all the time? And, and among you guys, I'm watching you guys. And I watch, and I've watched for 20 years. And I watch, are they faithful in the little things? Because you know what? You get the guys who, they they kind of appear like, and they 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 can talk like they'll be faithful if they're given a big thing. But no, 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 no. You watch them in the little. Watch what they do. Do they show up? Do they show up on time? Are they there? Because, folks, you know what? This, this has to do with God's people. And see, I don't take this lightly. Like, I'm looking for... If I'm looking for elders and deacons, if I'm looking for a church planner, if I'm looking for a missionary, it's like, is this guy faithful when nobody's watching? Because the, the faithfulness is to the word of God. The faithfulness is to the people of God. You, can, you can, cannot have somebody that's going to drop the ball. And I'll tell you, over the years, I, I recognize this. You can have elders. And, and, and guys come up into leadership and, you know, they, they may have wisdom. They may... They may have some type of teaching gift. But you know what I saw when, when James Jennings came along? I felt confidence. There's a man that's going to defend the church when I'm not here. If you're going to be in leadership, I mean, you got to stand for the cause. you got to stand for Christ's thing. No matter what the cost is, if you're really going to step into that position, there's many men that like the seeming glory of leadership, but the hardships, like Craig told me, Craig, Craig told me just recently, he said, brother, I tell my wife all the time, I don't know how you did this for 20 years. He said, I thought this was going to be hard. He said, you know, I just knew leadership was hard. He said, I never expected it was this hard. And the fact is that if you're a lightweight and you're not dependable and you're not trustworthy and you're not faithful, you'll drop the ball. You'll fall out. And, and that can even be as a deacon. But, you know, you get away from the church. You're out there in the field. You're, you're planting a church somewhere. Or you're, it, it, this is not easy. And so we're looking for people that have a loyalty to Christ, even when, you know, even when they don't feel well, even when, I mean, over the years, you know what? I, I, I can be given to migraines. But the fact is that when a prayer meeting happens, I need to be there. When Sunday service happens, I need to be there. And you know, you trust the Lord that he's going he's gonna to help in the midst of this. But Proverbs says this, lying lips are an abomination to the Lord, but those who act faithfully are his delight. Is that, it, it, listen to this. Proverbs 20 and verse 6, many a man proclaims his own righteousness or steadfast love or 
guys are always willing to tell, I, I cannot tell you how often over the years people tell me, well, I think I'm qualified for this and I think I'm qualified for that. I've had, I've had man after man after man declare to me what God has gifted or enabled him to be. And I have found nine times out of 10, the guy that wants to declare to me what God is, has done in him and is doing in him and called him to, it never comes to pass. The guy comes to me and declares to me that God's called him to pastor. I, I, I can just like say 99.9%. Yeah, probably not. But listen to this. Many a man proclaims his own steadfast love or his righteous, but a faithful man who can find. You know what? That comes out of the proverb. That is the same thing that said about a about this woman who is, uh, you know, very very rare to find in a wife. Uh, this Proverbs thirty one woman. She's she's rare like this. It is a true. Listen, guys. It is a true rarity to find a faithful man. It is not rare to find men who tell you they are faithful. Any, it is not rare to find men who talk. That is not rare. What's rare is true faithfulness. That's rare. And I'm just telling you this, guys. This comes out of Scripture. Timothy, find faithful men. A faithful man who can find. I mean, if we just think about faithfulness, think about a faithful wife. What is it? What does a faithful wife look like? I mean, what what would be the quality? It's a woman who enters into marriage and and she's faithful. What what? You know what the Proverbs thirty one says: the heart of her husband trusts in her. She does him good and not harm all the days of her life. You see, that's where I got. Just evaluating everybody, evaluating everybody. I recognize this. Oftentimes when hard things happened in the church, ahead of time, ahead of time, I would find that there are people saying, well, brother, you should do this. It's kind of like I, I likened it often to like a fight on the playground. You know, you can have your buddies that come up to you. Yeah, go get him. Go get him. They're, they're right there. They're all supportive of you. I've had people in the church like, hey, yeah, yeah, brother, you need to do that. This, this, That's not right. You need to take care of that situation. But you know what? When the sparks start flying and the, and the punches start being thrown, all of a sudden all your buddies, they back off. They're now standing way over there. And I've seen that in the church. All of a sudden some conflict comes and you can, you can find it very lonely. And I'll tell you this, if there was anybody that I knew was going to have my back, it was James Jennings. And, and, uh, you know, John was traveling. John, he was, he was out there moving around and some, you know, some of the other guys, I just maybe didn't get tested to the point, but I knew this, if I was in the early years when I would go away, I would have concerns about the church and is it going to be cared for? Once James was there, I didn't have that concern. What you want is somebody that you know they're going to give themselves to what they've been called to. Even I, I mean, they'll go down. They'll go down fighting. It, this, this has to do with Christ. It has to do with his church and it has to do with his truth. And they, they're going to be faithful. A faithful wife. You know what a faithful wife can be like? A husband could, could come like I did with that guy. A husband can come and he can look through the window and he's not going to find his wife doing things she ought not to be doing. He could listen in when the wife doesn't know, when she's there talking to the kids and she's not bad-mouthing, put him down, making him look bad in front of the kids. If she was talking to one of her friends on the phone, you know, if he was listening in, she's trustworthy. She's going to be the kind of woman that defends his reputation. And, and you, you, I, I mean, you know what that's like. And we find... You know, we could think of that in in somebody that's working in an office. We could think of that in in the life of a soldier. But you know, she's she's somebody that does him good. And if he just unexpectedly walks into the room or walks around the corner or unexpectedly comes home, he's not going to find her doing you know something that 
she shouldn't. It's, it's that kind of thing. It's like the boss walking in. It's, it's like, yeah, you recognize. You're living with the recognition that God is watching me. I am going to be faithful to this, even if it's, if it's the small things. And look, I can remember when we were planting a church in, uh, we were planted two churches, one in, one in Floresville and one in Stockdale. And I can remember times where I'd be out there mowing the lawn and I was the only one and something needed to be repaired and I was there working on it and nobody else was there. But I was, you know, I was thinking, I want to be faithful. I was there evangelizing. Nobody was watching. Pat Horner wasn't driving around in his car looking through binoculars watching me. I mean, he might have been, but I didn't know if he was. But it was like, I just recognize this. I want to be faithful to the Lord. If the lawn needs to be cut, and let's cut the lawn. I mean, I'm serving the Lord. And I never, at that point in time, I had no idea that I would end up in ministry, let alone that God would do all the things that he did at, at grace. You know, I've, it was just be faithful with the little things. Be faithful. And, and, you know, this is, this is one of the things that I was saying to the church the other day. And I don't know which, I don't know which, which of you actually heard me say this, but you know, when I was talking about, um, I, I said something like, you know, some of you British people maybe need to take less holidays and actually be in your place. I mean, isn't it possible that at a very possible at, at the very time your gifts are needed in something or your presence is needed in something, you're off on holiday. And, and, you know, there are times when holidays are necessary and there's times when holidays can become crippling just because a boss gives you so much time away. I mean, there were, there were lots of times throughout the years, men at, at, in San Antonio use their holidays specifically for the sake of the ministry. They would use it specifically for the sake of traveling somewhere to disperse the gospel. To, they would use it specifically to go on some kind of, uh, you know, medical missionary trip. And oftentimes the men did that. And so, you know, again, this this all comes down to faithfulness. Faithfulness is is there. Anyway, I, <clears throat> I'm I'm watching for that. You know, who's at their post? Who comes on time? Who, who is showing that they're going to be there to serve? Who is showing that they're going to be there for the sake of the church? Who recognizes there are needs here and they seek to meet those needs? Who recognizes that you've got a church and we need to serve one another and there's setup required and, the, you know, certain things have to happen to make sure that all the video happens or, or the sound system works right or uh, people are greeted who might be visiting or the food is actually all put into place for the fellowship time. Um, you know, one of the things that one of the things that comes out and marks a faithful servant is o obedience. And there's no mystery in this. I mean, Scripture's plain. If you faithfully obey my voice, the voice of the Lord your God, being careful to do all His commandments. He said, God says, I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who shall do according to what is in my heart and in my mind. I will look with favor on the faithful in the land that they may dwell with me. He who walks in the way that is blameless. You see what, what faithful is connected with in all of these. Um, I think that one of the one, I mean, this just blows me away. First Corinthians, Timothy, my beloved and faithful child in the Lord, faithful. Do you know what he says in Philippians about Timothy? He says, I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. 
for they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. And so look, guys, what I'm at, think about that. Think about the example of Timothy. That comes out of Philippians chapter 2, verses 20 and 21. I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare, for they all seek their own interest, not those of Jesus Christ. What I am constantly watching for is that. Are they faithful? Are they, do they actually look to the needs of others and they're going to be faithful? What I'm looking for is guys that would lay down their life rather than to be unfaithful. They're going to they're gonna be at their post. They're going to be in their place. They're going to be ready to serve. Like I say, it's a dime a dozen guys that want to be in leadership. It's a dime a dozen guys that want to preach. They're everywhere. You guys are here because probably you have some aspirations for that. Guys with aspiration are multitude. I can tell you this. They're everywhere. And so what I've had to do through the years is I've had to figure out, okay, well, who has this desire? Who has this burden? And, hey, there's validity to it. Who has this burden and there's probably validity to it, but they're not ready yet. Who aspires to this? And it's just very obvious. They probably need to be thinking about something else. Well, one of the big things that comes up in my mind is not primarily your gift. I am not looking. I look at gift. I'm wonder. you know, I'm surveying the land. How well do they preach? <clears throat> and gift. When we think about gear, spiritual gifts, we can look at things like, you know, do they preach? Do they exhort? Do they have abilities to uh, speak with their mouth in any fashion that is fruitful to God's people? I mean, do they have special gifts of mercy? Do they have special gifts of evangelism? Do they have, I, I mean, you know, I'm looking at the gift, but the starting point is faithfulness. I am watching that because I recognize this. You can have Spurgeon-esque gifts, but if you're not faithful, I've got no use for you, quite honestly. And I don't think Christ does. And I don't think Paul would have. Because Paul says, look, I don't have anybody like him. I can depend on him that if he goes over here, he's actually going to give himself to your welfare. And, and isn't it interesting when they all seek their own interests, not those of Christ. You see, that's what it says when a guy's not faithful. He's seeking his own interest. The guy that... Well, it's like, where's so and so? And why does, I mean, did, did he, did he let somebody know that he wasn't going to, I mean, you know, you, you're just, you're looking for that. You're looking for faithfulness, faithfulness, faithfulness. And you all, you just know what you guys want in a faithful wife. You know what, what an employer wants in a faithful employee. You know what a military leader wants in a faithful soldier. I mean, you, you've got ideas about this. You know what a faithful slave looks like or a faithful servant. And, and so, and, and, you know what? There is a principle, and it's valid. If you're faithful in little, you'll be faithful in much. And I, through the years, I've come across guys that want to assure me that if they go to India, they'll be faithful. I've had guys tell me that. Well, you know, I'm doing, I'm doing rotten here, but I think if I got put in a place like that, then I'd really excel. It's like, no, you won't. That, that's just a delusion. How you would even think that I'm going to excel as a missionary in India when I'm pathetic at home, that this doesn't happen. And the Bible doesn't say it'll, it's going to happen. And so, anyway, guys, um, this is something to really, I, I mean, look, you have to think about this before the Lord. Because, yes, I'm watching. But you have to think about this. If, if you're only faithful when I'm watching, it's like a guy that works and he's only faithful when he knows his boss is watching. And then what's the boss going to find? Well, his boss going to find when he all of a sudden comes charging through the doors when nobody expects him. He's not going to find them faithful. And that's, see, that's what Jesus says. That unfaithful servant, what's going to happen? Well, when I come, I'm going to find him what? 
he's going to be beating the servants over here and he's going to be getting drunk. And see, that's what happens when he doesn't know. But what you want is guys with a conscience that they recognize they do what they do under the watchful eye of God. And I'll tell you this, as much as you do it under one of the least of these, my little ones, you do it to me. I mean, you really want to think that, that as, as you are thinking about any kind of leadership or any kind of usefulness, you have to recognize this. Christ is ultimately the one that is going to open the door for you to be put in a place. Men can have all sorts of plans, but ultimately it's going to be the Lord. And it's kind of like, it's kind of like what's taught in 2 Timothy just a little later here about a useful vessel. Well, a, a useful vessel, the Lord's going to take it off the shelf and he's going to use it. But an unfit vessel, well, one of the things that really makes a person unfit is when they don't have faithfulness. You know, when a husband all of a sudden listens into his wife and founds, finds she's bad mouth him, she's not loyal, she's not pure, she's not, you know, you, there, there was a story about men in uh, the United States that went off to war in Vietnam. Some of those guys were taken prisoner of war and some of them stayed there in those, those prison camps, the Hanoi Hilton, for seven or eight years. And you know what? When those men were, when they were flown back to the United States, there was some bargaining done between the governments. And so a bunch of these POWs were released and they were flown back. And you know, a number of those men they came off that airplane. There was nobody there to meet them. Their wives had been unfaithful. Their wives had moved on. Their wives had divorced them. But you know what some of those men found? They found that their wives had not moved their things in the bedroom. They had not changed the pillowcase on their pillow in eight years because they wanted to lean over and try to still get something of the aroma of their husband. They left everything on their dresser just the way it was in anticipation of the day when their husband would come home. They stayed pure. They, they kept the pictures there before their children. They talked to their children about daddy who they hadn't seen in eight years. And you know, some of those, that is a faithful wife. And, and we're, and we are the wife. I mean, we, we, in the truest sense, we're the wife of Christ. And so faithfulness, and it's there. It's, it's not something I'm making up. It's, it's in scripture. There's something to a faithful steward. There's something to Timothy, find faithful men. And Timothy, being a faithful man, there's something about those words. They all seek their own interests. Not they, they all. Isn't that amazing? The apostle Paul, with all the influence he had and the churches that sprang up and all the people that had been saved and the people that ran with him, they all, this isn't just Demas, they all seek their own interest. Oh, the proverb is right. It is not rare to find men who want to tell you about their own qualities, but it is extremely rare to truly find a faithful man. So what do you think? Should we move on? It's very challenging. Yeah, very it is fitting. challenging. Yeah, very fitting. No, it is challenging. And uh, it's something to really deeply think about, something to deeply pray about. And, and like I say, even in the days when I didn't realize I was going to be a pastor, in the days that I had no idea that God would make me a pastor in a church that he would, you know, multiply over and over and over and raise up 
gifted guys and, and allow us so many open doors. I mean, I really count it a privilege to have experienced all that I experienced for those 20 years. But in those early days when I was getting the first opportunity to be involved in some church plants, I, I mean, I, you know, I, I would have thoughts about when, you know, nobody else is there and you're the only guy. And you know, what's going through your mind? Are, are you just going to have a pity party? But if you actually think, well, the Lord's watching and the Lord's pleased that I'm out here mowing the lawn on this place where his people meet to worship. I mean, this is a way I can serve him. And uh, yes, there are other people involved in this work and it would be nice if they were here. I mean, you show up for a work party in those little church plants. Um, it, it, I can remember some of the other guys showing, even one or two other guys showing up would just be a massive encouragement. But it's just, I had it in my mind, I'm going to tend the lawn. I had it in my mind, I'm going to try to get the gospel to every single home in this community. I had it in my mind that, you know, I was going to be there early. I was going to set up. I was going to make sure that things were ready to go. I was going to be ready to have material to, to preach to the people. And uh, it's like I say, when, when uh, you know, other men, uh, other men were undoubtedly faithful. But when James came along, it was just, wow. Like I could really trust he, like he's, he's going to, he's going to take care of it. He's going to get it done. He, he's concerned. He, he, I mean, he really stood out head and shoulders above the others. And it's it just a phenomenal example. Like I could feel about him, like Paul felt about Timothy, like, you know, I, well, I can just entrust something that has to do with the church, has to do with the souls of the people, has to do with some, something that needs to be done here. And uh, he's going to do it. He's going to do it well. He's going to do it thorough. He's, he's, that, that was a real, um, that, that was a significant point in the life of the church because suddenly I felt really good about, all the requests that I was getting to go other places. What aspect, like, obviously, I, you know, I, I speak with James a lot and I've seen his faithfulness, if I'll be honest. Um, and that's probably like, a, you know, because a lot of men start websites, start blogs, want to help people, but they don't really carry it on. But he's, you know, kept it going to stay while it's been an elder. But what are like some aspects of James's life where, outside of I'll be honest? Okay, well, no, let's take I'll be honest. First, he absolutely refused, and this we, we did this together, but absolutely refused to ever make. If, if you know the number of hits, I'll be honest, gets it's, it's astronomical. We could make, he could make significant money off of, I'll be honest. But we said, freely we receive, freely we give. We're not going to, we've not made a penny off of, I'll be honest. We allow no advertising, and I'll be honest. And uh, James specifically removed the ability to see. Now, if things get tossed on YouTube, this the number of hits isn't hidden. But as far as I'll be honest, there's there's no visibility of how many hits things are getting. Why? Because there's, there's, he's principled. We're not going to make money. We're not going to puff our heads up to know how many hits we're getting. There's not even going to be a temptation there. And, and, you know, he, he did it without me having to tell him to do it. He made it run 
smooth and flawless without having to have his arm twisted, without having to look over his shoulder, without having to ask him all the time, hey, are you doing this? Is this getting done? He's a guy that did it. I had him, um, I, I had him lead the men's grace house and you know what? He sought to be faithful. I mean, did he have rough edges? Yes, he had rough edges, but he sought to be faithful. Rough edges, I don't care about. Lack of certain gifts, not the big issue. But he sought to be faithful to those men's souls. He sought that. And so, you know, he he was probably one of the youngest and most unpolished guys to, to ever get brought into the eldership. But that was one of the primary qualities. And he really is conscientious. And, uh, you know, like I say, it's, it's, not, it's not to say that the other men aren't, but I just, I know this. If, if I, uh, you know, if it came down to somebody having my back, I knew he was there. And, it, you know, when things got hard, when things get hard, it is, I mean, really hard. And whatever that looks like, it is easy for men to capitulate when things get hard. It is easy to look around and say, you know, the battle's tough. You want the guy in the trenches with you that isn't retreating. He's not falling back. When the devil is foaming at the mouth, when you got false Christians in the midst or false teachers, or you've got to do some really difficult thing, you know, you, you want somebody, somebody around that's not going to abdicate. And yeah, I mean, that's typically what we were looking for in, in anybody that would be an elder in the church. Or even as a deacon, I mean, any kind of position, you just you want to see that there's a faithfulness. I mean, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, a man that you know you guys met, Matt Wilkinson. I mean, I, you know, again, are there rough edges? Have there been certain uh, failures? Yeah, we're not dealing with perfect men, but when it comes to to just faithfulness, like I. You know, I have no problem with Matt being sent off to anywhere in the world. And I just have this, you know, a good confidence that he is going to be radical. He's going to be energetic. He's not going to sleep in late. He's not going to pilfer the time away. He's, he's going to be after souls. He's going to get after it. He is dependable. He is worth his weight in gold. And uh, that's what you want. And yeah, like I say, guys can have rough edges, but faithfulness, I mean, it, it, nothing makes up for a lack of it. And it doesn't matter how gifted, how polished you are, nothing makes up for a lack of it. And you know, if a guy says, well, you know, I can't be faithful because my wife. Well, you know what? Right there. If a guy can't manage his own household in order to be faithful, then... That's, that's no excuse. Because when it comes to God's people, it doesn't matter the reason why somebody isn't in their, at their post when they need to be. If they're not there and the enemy's coming and they're not at their post, if the thing needs to be done and they're not at their post, the reason, it's like in, a, in the war, it's like the reason that the watchman isn't on the wall doesn't really matter if he's not there. Then, then what happens? The city gets taken. I mean, it, it's, it's like, you know, you're looking for the guy who's going to be faithful despite pressures from other places. And, you know, I'm, I'm not talking perfection. But you see when, when somebody is like a Timothy where Paul can say, you know, I've seen it. What's Paul saying? I've made these observations. I've made observations about Timothy and I've made observations about all the rest. And you know what I see? I see that when somebody's needed at the post and somebody's needed there to take care of God's people, he's there. Well, even, you know, you come over to, to, to Paul speaking to Timothy. 
And does it seem like Timothy might have wavered sometimes or might have, you know, yeah. I mean, the way, the way Paul talks to him and seeks to encourage him. But in the end, for Paul to say all the rest, I mean, I, I feel convicted whenever I read that. It's like all the rest. And it's like, would I be counted faithful by Paul's standard? I mean, do I seek my own thing when I should be? I mean, it's something to really think about. Can I, can I ask him, what do you think the big, or, or, or the differences between Christians who lack faithfulness and those who thrive in faithfulness? Like what, what are those who are thriving in faithfulness doing that those who lack it? Like, or what would you say? Um, I think it, a lot of it has to do with conviction that God's watching. You know, what, what is unbelief? You know, unbelief, people can say they believe in God, but if they don't operate like the God of the Bible in all of his reality and all of his glory is watching, he's close, he sees me, he knows what I'm thinking, I have to answer to him, I can please him, I can grieve his spirit, I can be in a place where he opens doors for me. You know, one of the things I've, I, I, that I don't even know how to put words to is the, the way that what God has done over the last 30 years, I just, like, I realize I'm a nobody. And that have been thrust into the situation, not only to, to lead, but to see God save and build this church and to see hundreds and hundreds and, and to have God raise up gifted people and throw doors open to South America and Central America and Mexico and various places around Texas to plant churches and, and then off in India and, and to have us involved the way we have in, in Lebanon, in Indonesia, in China, in uh, Nepal. I, I can't, I, I mean, I was telling Craig, Brother, God has let us experience things that Craig, Craig and I, when we first got saved, we'd sit in his living room on Friday nights with our Bibles open, a lot of times looking at the book of Acts, and with our biography of Whitfield, and we'd just be, Craig, where is this? Where is this? I remember one night I said, this, this was in the day of VCR. I said, there, he had a pile of VCRs under his VCR player. I said, Craig, one of those VCRs underneath there is your life. I said, do you want to watch it? Like it's going to show us what's going to happen in the years ahead. I mean, we could have never imagined that when we said, where is it, that burning in our hearts for it, God was going to, God was going to do it. God was, I mean, no, we didn't see things to the scale that Whitfield saw, or even necessarily to the scale that you might find in the book of Acts. But for us to start out with 12 people and go down to 10 and just clawing out an existence at, at, among the prostitutes and the crack addicts on Hackberry Street with just, I mean, we were a motley crew. We were not gift. We were nobodies by the world standard. I mean, we had 10 people who were nobodies in the inner city of San Antonio. I mean, what's that? And, and God worked. And so, um, but yes, back to your question, 
it's it's having a clear conscience before God. It's it's like asking yourself, you know, am I being faithful? Am I, um, you know, God's watching? See, the thing is, if a guy can jump when he knows I'm watching or jump when he knows the boss is watching, but he doesn't jump when he knows God's watching, that's nothing but unbelief. That is entire. What you want is people who walk as in the sight of God. They recognize the one I need to please is not ultimately the pastor or the boss or the husband. I'm living my life before the Lord. And, and there really is something to being faithful in little. And there really is something to be being a vessel that's fit for the master's use. And I think a big fact of that is faithfulness. If you're faithful in little, you will be faithful in much. And what I have found is that if you're faithful in little, God's going to open the door to an opportunity to be faithful in much. It's, it's kind of like, you know how the proverb talks about the guy who's really diligent in his work? Who's he going to stand before? Not before mean men. He's mean, little, insignificant. He's going to stand before kings. That, see, that's something that if a man can just not think on that, it's like he's just thinking about his appetites. He's thinking about sex and he's thinking about food. And he's thinking about how he feels all the time. And he's thinking about uh, his clothing and he's thinking about getting attention and being in the limelight and wants recognition. If a guy's wired that way, he won't be faithful. He'll be faithful. He'll do what he does. It, like Paul says, they seek their own ways. They'll be seeking money. They'll be seeking clothes. They'll be seeking fame. They'll be seeking attention. They'll be seeking this, that, and the other thing. But see, I like the guy. You want to pay attention because, you know, there's, there's something about what is the guy seeking? If a guy's seeking to be faithful, that's going to look different from the guy that's seeking attention and glamour and glory. And, and he, he wants to be seen. He wants to be famous. He loves applause. He loves, uh, you can tell that. You can tell that. And look, I know we all have tendencies that we have to fight and seek to put to death. And every one of us have ways that pride can uh, manifest itself that we have to seek to put to death. But it's like Paul. I don't think Paul's necessarily saying that all these guys that seek their own are not Christians. But I don't think, I, I, you know, I don't think he's saying Timothy's the only Christian I know. You know what he's saying? He's saying that even among the Christian ranks, and even among the guys that I've been using in the ministry, Timothy shines in a way that the other guys just don't. That makes him dependable when the truth is I just can't really depend on the others. And this, this, is, this is so significant. And if, and if you know, if you hear it and then you forget it, you know, that's significant. If it's like, oh, well, you know, you take it seriously today and it's, it's fresh and it's on your mind. See, I, 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 know, I know that this is a principle that I've ne I, I can't get away from. And it, it resurges with me all the time and it produces conviction. Like, I, I, I want to be faithful. I want to be faithful. I want to be faithful. You guys aren't watching. My wife isn't watching, but I, I, I want to be faithful. God is watching. I want to be faithful to walk with him in prayer. I want to be faithful to rightly divide the word and be in the word and give myself like those early apostles to the word and to prayer. I want to be faithful to your guys' souls. I want to be faithful. I want to be faithful with my time and my life. 
And I'm not saying that I am in all of it, but but it's kind you know, if if you can just forget it and it's not an issue, and you go back to thinking more about, well, how can I be popular and how can I you know, you just how how can I how can I get the platform? How can I get in front of people? Um, you know, Andy talking about leadership training, he, he asserts the same thing. The guys are everywhere that want to be in leadership and want to preach. They're everywhere. So when I walk into a church or I walk into different situations, it's, it's like, yeah, is it going to surprise me? I mean, if I if I go to this men's conference, is it, it would it surprise me to have men come up to me and tell me that they feel called to this, that, and the other thing? No, that will not surprise me because I hear it all the time. Well, would it surprise me to have guys come up and and tell me about their own, you know, qualifications or their own strengths or their own qualities? No. That would not surprise me. Why? Because it happens all the time. I, I, I hear that. And I don't just write somebody off, but I have come to recognize that <clears throat> over the years I came to recognize this. The guy that the first time I met wants to assure me he's called to pastor. He never has proven to be the guy that's going to pastor. In fact, what I end up finding is he's the guy that has some real glaring uh, deficiencies of character. So that's just been my experience. And, you know, Scripture says it. The guys are a dime a dozen that are going to proclaim their own stuff, but a faithful man who can find. Yep. So it's about um, faith. As you said, you know the the, the contrary of that of faithlessness, well, of, of unfaithfulness is 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 unbelief, really, and uh, it takes faith to actually, um, well, do something which won't have an immediate reward, which is not seen by others immediately, which won't receive, uh, uh, you know, people won't recognize it straight away, and that kind of thing. Yeah, faith, sight, sight is I see the teacher. I see the husband, I see the admiral over there, I see the pastor, but they just don't seem to be able to see the Lord like they see those. They'll act one way in front of those watching eyes, but then the moment when those people aren't watching, they'll go act this way and they'll do this thing. They'll get sloppy with their eyes or porn or uh, laziness or whatever. It's like, well, you know, if Pastor Tim was here in the house watching, I wouldn't talk to my wife that way, or I wouldn't do this, or I wouldn't do that other thing. But then it's like, well, wait, is God watching you all the time? Well, yes, but you know, that just doesn't have the same bearing. Well, what is, what is that? That's, that's just nothing but unbelief. As a person that lives by sight, I'm not saying they're an unbeliever, but it definitely says something about the degree of faith in which they're actually walking. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah. So social media doesn't uh, help this generation with uh, with that because, like, anything you post, anything you you say there, you, you get immediate reaction, immediate uh, like um, gratification. Yeah, we do live in the this, and and we have to recognize that. Yeah, the way the Lord works is, uh, you know, building character is not is not immediate. Developing a reputation is not immediate. You know, reputation is something that comes over time. Faithfulness is something that comes over time. And, uh, yeah, that immediate gratification... And even there, the social media, I mean, it's, you know, is a guy being faithful when he basically, I'm not saying you can't be on social media, and I'm not saying you can't watch things, but again, there's got to be a just a connectiveness with the fact that God is watching. Is this pleasing him? Is this 
Is this good? Is this okay? Am I being brought under the power of something? All things might be lawful, but is it is it necessarily expedient for me? Am I being brought under some kind of power that I ought not to be? Wasn't, wasn't there a tract like that? Uh, I think I've uh, heard you read it years ago, and I'll be honest, maybe. Um, I think it's called Others May You Can Others. Like right. Conrad Merle wrote that. Right. Yeah, yeah. Is, is it kind of to do with the same thing? Or? Well, I mean, that's just basically... Letting go of... It, it's a conscience issue. It's it's kind of... It, it would... I, I don't remember the text that he deals with, but you know how, you know how Romans 14 ends. That whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Well, faith there, I think, has to do with not not so much whether you're a believer or not, but if you believe it's right, that's what faith has to do with there. Do I believe it's right? Do I believe it's wrong? You see, if God permits you to do something, but you think he hasn't, and you go ahead and do it, well, God sees that. God sees that you went and did something you don't think he approved of. So even though he did, isn't the issue. The issue is you were willing to go do what you knew he didn't want you to do. Or at least you thought he didn't want you to do. So, I mean, that's, that's the real matter. That's the heart issue. That's why whatever is not a faith is sin. And so one guy observes the day, one guy doesn't observe the day, but they're both doing it out of conviction that what they're doing is right. They believe that what they're doing pleases the Lord. One guy eats the meat. One guy doesn't eat the meat. One guy drinks wine. One guy doesn't drink wine. And, you know, it comes down to that. Does he believe that it's okay with the Lord? Hey, follow up from like uh, Sharif's question. What about then, let's say, you know, you hear some of these things and you recognize things might not be the best, not even necessarily for ministry, but just then building faithfulness from the where you are, you know, currently. Building faithfulness? Yeah, as in like, at your starting point, you know, recognize, okay, so maybe things need to change. Well, what to do then in, in terms of like growing and cultivating? Yeah, yeah. Well, y you know who's really big today is this guy Jordan Peterson. Have you thought about, I mean, basically he says he was really surprised that when he was a professor at Harvard that he was even able to get, go as long as he possibly could because, you know, his his methods and his teaching are not necessarily this, this left-wing type of thing. A lot of Christians can amen a good degree of what Jordan Peterson says. You know why? Because it's principally right. What does he say? He tells young men. You know, where, you know what the starting point is? I've not read his book, but... Uh, I know he's got a book like 12 something, 12 Rules for Life. And uh, I know that Ruby was interested in that from the standpoint of, you know, how that, how, how that does reflect upon our young people and even in Christian values. But, you know, I, I don't know what all his 12 points are, but one of the things he starts with is just learn how to get out of bed and keep your room clean. Huh. Well, what, what's that got to do with? Well, self-discipline. I mean, master your life. Don't be a guy... I, I mean, get control of your own bedroom first. If you want to know how to get... Again, this is the little thing method. You got you to gotta figure out... I mean, a guy's got to figure out a guy that can't get to work on time, a guy that can't get to church on time. I mean, you know what? That right there says volumes. Can a man master his life and his time to actually be at places when he should be there? 
That's a huge issue. Why? Well, because if if a guy can't make it, if he can't, if he doesn't have the discipline to get there when he's supposed to get there, I mean, what's going to happen? What's going to happen when he has to get there because because the church needs looking after, the church needs protection, the church needs this. I mean, you know, if a guy can't get out of bed on time, if a guy's not that disciplined, if a guy sleeps till 10 o'clock, if a guy can't control his appetites, if a guy can't say no to this food or actually fast in his life because he just can't, he doesn't have control over his appetites, I mean, it's going to be, it's going to be trouble. And so I don't know, all, like I say, I don't know all Jordan Peterson's points, but he's basically saying to young men, you know, a, a good place to start before you start thinking about, you know, conquering the, the this, the, you know, conquering the business world or, or, you know, getting success in, in life. He's like, you just have to start out at, at down at the microcosm level. And, and I would say, absolutely. Be faithful in small things. You got to start just looking at, you know, like, like I was telling Joshua about Sam Patron. Sam is going after souls. Like, I'd get up, where's Sam? And he's over here in Middleton preaching the gospel. They get up. Where's Sam? Hey, he wrote he he bought a bike and he rode the bike off and he's preaching at the tram station. Where's Sam? Well, he's over here, he's over there, he's doing this, he's doing that. It's like here here's the thing. Here's the thing. I mean, seriously. Sam Sam tells me. I uh I, I bought these two quad runners. And me, I, I probably told you guys the story. But he said, I, I bought two quad runners. Well, where did he buy them? He bought them in Denver. But he wants to take the gospel. See, he's looking. He wants to take the gospel to Guatemala. I believe it was Guatemala, not Honduras. But I think it was right there at Guatemala on the Honduras border. And so Sam wants to get the gospel up in there. And so what does he do? Well, he buys two quad runners. What's he, a, sorry, what's a yeah, quad runner? Yeah, quad they're they're four-wheel drive motorcycles, oh, right. basically, off-road. Right, yeah, yeah. yeah, quad runners. So he so he he finds a really good deal on two of those. So he buys them, he ships them to Florida, has them put on a in a shipping container, and ships them down to Guatemala. And then he drives his truck from Denver in, through Mexico and, and into Guatemala. And so, and then he get, goes and gets the quad runners out of customs and he has carburetor trouble and he basically figures that out. And then he's got these quad runners up up in the mountains there, throw him in the back of his truck, which he drove down there. He leaves his truck there. He leaves the two quad runners there. He actually builds, hand, hand builds an airplane, <laughs> forms the fiberglass and everything. It's, it's like, it's the same one that, that, that uh, John Denver crashed in. It's it's like a it's, it's some kind of high performance little deal, and and Sam Sam tested that thing out there along I seventy. He just took it up. He said, "When you're building this aircraft, he said you hey, you need to go out and you need to to test it." So he said he went out and he was following I seventy in case he had any problems. He he would land it on the interstate highway. And, and so he takes off out of Denver and he follows I-70, goes, goes east, straight. I mean, they, they built all those interstates to crisscross the country. And so he said he just pegged it full, I, I mean, he, he, he full throttle. 
and he said it stalled. And uh, he was trying all sorts of things and he couldn't get it to start. And so he's he's coming down. He said he saw there was a semi below him, you're one of your lorries. And <clears throat> he said he didn't want to land in front of the truck because he didn't want to freak the driver out. And so he was positioning to come in and land behind this truck. And uh, he, was, he was able to fire the thing up before he actually had to make an emergency landing. He went back and he said the guy in the next stall uh, in the aircraft hangar said, you know, because it was all new and everything, he said, you, you ought to check your fuel filter. He said, a lot of times, you know, when you've just put everything together, you get a bunch of junk that accumulates in there. And he said, sure enough. And so when he had it at full throttle, basically starved the engine out. But he was able to refire when, but, but so he created this because he and his brother owned an airplane, but it wasn't fuel efficient enough to get all the way across Mexico and into Guatemala. And so uh, he was having to land in Mexico. Well, the Mexicans are so crooked. And he said, every time I had to land in Mexico to refuel, they always were wanting bribes and char charging fees for just, just made up stuff. And he, and he said, I don't want to do that anymore. So he creates his own aircraft, fuel efficient enough to fly all the way across. And so he'd fly all the way across. He's got his truck there. He'd throw the, throw the four-wheeler in the back, and then he'd drive up in these mountains, and he'd take the gospel up there. <clears throat> well, see, I said to Sam, Sam, I said, you got to be taking guys like these two guys. We got to take guys like that to Zambia. I said, because... Because the average guy, the average young guy in our church has no idea how to ship two quad runners to Guatemala. I said, how to ship them over to, to Florida and actually get them on a shipping container and on a boat and have them taken down there. The average guy, he doesn't even think he can accomplish that. He doesn't think he can do that. I said, Sam, you need to be pouring that kind of thing into other people. Well, when he comes here, I see that very thing. I see, you know what? He, he takes initiative. He's going to go out there and do it. He's going to make things happen. He's a guy that can, is going to be dependable. He's going to He's, he's on the go. He's thinking. He, he has plans. He has strategies. He overcomes his own desire to, you know, do other things and to make those things happen. He's got priorities in his life. He, he's a guy that's going somewhere. He's a guy with direction. He's, the thing is, though, he sometimes so, but he, he said that he sometimes like so that, that he hasn't got, like he hasn't got time for anyone who's kind of, not as well, he does like to operate. Just want to be slowed down. He does like to operate by himself, and yeah. sometimes he does think yes. But, but aside from the fact, I mean, we can talk about you know how much he should be pouring into other guys to impart what he knows and what he can do. But what I'm really, I mean, because all this has to do with faithfulness. It's like, and and even there, you know, it's, and Sam likes to downplay this, but you know. His wife divorced him. And when she came to the place where it looked like she was going to be on the street, he took her in. And I tell him he's modern day Hosea. He doesn't like to admit that. But you know what? That there's there's truth in that. And uh, you know, I know I know he's not been perfect. He'd be the first guy to admit that. But again, even there, it's like, you know, faithfulness. Here, here, even though his wife divorced him, and even though, you know, a lot of guys might say, well, I'm done with her and whatever. I mean, he sought to be faithful and he sought to care for. Her. And, uh, you know, even with his desire to evangelize, he's constantly making these trips back to the United States. Why? He's trying to be faithful to his wife. And he, and he talked to Ruby and me about that. Just, you know, he, he, he wants to reach people all around the world, but at the same time, he wants to he wants to do the best possible thing that he can for his wife and wants her in the best possible place she can be for the sake of her soul. <clears throat> do you think, I just like uh, on that, just with like touching on family and responsibilities in the family, as it relates to faithfulness here, uh, like, you know, obviously, like some men are single. Uh, well, I'll, I'll give this example. You've got like single men, obviously, like if they've got holiday time that like, they can book off work, then 
to some degree, they've got more freedom than than a married man who has children to be able to be like, right, I'm going to go, I'm going to go Africa. I'm gonna it's go. true. Um, but you know, obviously, the even a married man who has their um, responsibilities and has children could also do that, you know, provided that you know the wife was supportive of it, and you know it wasn't going to put too much on her kind of thing. But I guess like. See, because I, I think it's quite important to like, uh, especially as a married man with 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 young children, that with some of my with, mo- with a lot of my holiday time, I'll use that as time to go away with my family, and kind of uh, spend like quality time with them. Um, but at the same time, I, I know that this year I had a week off, and I said to Ruth, "I'm going to go Liverpool. I'm going to go Leeds." And, you know, go out when she was happy for me to do that. But, yeah, I just kind of wondered, like, you know, how do you make them decisions a bit of, like, of, of, of time of uh, recuperation and, and quality time with the family and, you know, actually saying, no, I'm going to, you know, I am going to go to a, to a, to the, a, a missionary endeavour. or. Preaching. Well, every man's got to sort that out. But... Um, you know, I think that, like I took Mondays off because my children homeschooled, they had Mondays off. And so that was family day. We could have existed on that without going to Colorado for, on a vacation. But the thing was like, I went, I went two years, one stretch with no holiday and it about killed me. And and then finally I got away to Colorado and, but see what I, what I began to recognize, was it a good time with the family? Absolutely. Did we all love it there? Yes. Was it cool coming out of the hundred degree plus heat? Yes. But for my sanity, it, it was necessary. Even Jesus said to his disciples, look, we need to get away. Yeah. And and it, there's a time that for recharging. But the thing is, over here in Europe, you guys have more holidays and more vacation than what you need for recharging. I, I, I found that it wasn't good to try to go two years without a vacation. But, you know, like when I came here... And I found that in the contract you guys made with me, I was given 28 days, 28 days, not including holidays or uh, not including weekends, but like 28 work days of holiday. Well, I didn't take that serious, (laughs) but it's like, I mean, how that plays out in reality, I mean. Well, yes, it doesn't. It doesn't play out in reality, because one and of the things. I'm going to go away for the whole of July. Is one I mean, radical. look, the, one of the problems with, like, uh, you know, li- one of the problems is when I went when I went away to uh, f- to Colorado, I was I, I was I really sought to be separated from the work, but in the normal course of things, when there's a three day weekend. And everybody's like, oh, great, it's Labor Day, it's Memorial Day, it's 4th of July. You know what? Thanksgiving. I still have to preach Sunday. I still have to prepare that message. I still get the phone call from the guy in the church that's having problems with his wife. And you know what? That doesn't stop. And so while everybody else, yes, would I go eat at Thanksgiving? Yes. But see... Oftentimes, in the morning, Thanksgiving morning, Thanksgiving's on Thursday, I was preparing for Sunday on, on Thursday morning. And then it'd be like, you know, Ruby's like, well, it's, it's time to go over the butter bars. And okay, but all morning, I, I was working on this. <clears throat> and so for the, you know, yeah, tomorrow might be Memorial Day, but Mondays are my day off anyway. 
So this isn't special. In fact, this is even worse because now on my day off, when everything's usually wide open and there's, I'm not fighting crowds, now all of a sudden my day off, everybody's off. And so it's really no good because now everybody's in our way and everybody's, you know, the things that we would usually do and go do my banking, the banks are closed. And so th those weren't especially. I, you know, well, I think that's really like, you know, that Monday was obviously like very crucial, wasn't it, in your family life? I mean, if you didn't have that, that that could have been detrimental to. Yeah, most every pastor has. A th I know Spurgeon took Thursdays off. Uh, I think I think uh, MacArthur did he take Saturdays off? Because it really is quite a different lifestyle, isn't it, to your average man? Because obviously a man, generally speaking, will rest on the weekend because that's the, that's the days that he's not in, in employment. Where with the, the pastor, that Saturday, there's probably quite heavy preparation because it's the day before preaching. Uh, or whether you, you do that early in the week or... And then on that Sunday, that's actually the day where you give the message. And that's like you're pouring your soul into the message. So by... <clears throat> so that Sunday doesn't feel like a rest, right? Like, does Sundays feel like a rest to you? Oh, no. Okay. No, that's it's why... Big work day, isn't it? <clears throat> that's hmm? like a big work day, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, and, yeah, preaching can be exhausting, and then be, you know, all the people and the demands. Yeah, we typically come home after Sunday and just... Not only exhausted, there seems like there's a spiritual, I mean, a lot of pastors face a spiritual depression and a spiritual gloom, and it's not fake. I mean, it's it's real, and it may even be devilish I, to some degree. But um, it's, it's like, you know, it's like Satan is really out to, to get fearful men and to fall and, and to become discouraged by like but i would just say for any christian whether, whether you're a pastor or not the the fact is that for every christian is life just simply okay i'm going to i'm going to go to my job you know even for the christian there's what place should my, even if I, let's just say I have your typical 40 hour a week job and I have a family, but what am I going to do? Am I going to serve the church? Am I going to serve the people? Am I going to be involved in, in visiting the, the widow and the orphan in their affliction? Am I going to be involved in visiting those in prison, visiting the sick, visiting the naked, visiting the hungry, visiting the thirsty? Am I going to be involved in that? Am I going to attend the prayer meeting? Am I going to, you know, if if there's a project that's happening, if there's a team going over here, am I going to be involved in that? And see, the thing in San Antonio that I really wanted to instill is an all-out church involvement in ministry. We are equipping people for the sake of the ministry. Everybody has a ministry. I mean, one of the things that that I feel that the church over here had too much of a mindset of is, you know, what the pastor does. The, the fact is that those apostles wanted to give themselves to prayer. They wanted to give themselves to the word. We have a, we have a responsibility to equip the church for the sake of ministry. And so that is an active church. That is a church where everybody has a ministry. They've got a part to play. This is a body that's made up of people with different gifts, the different members. Some are eyes, some are hands, some are feet. So we're not all the same, but everybody's got a part to play. And so this isn't just about, well, I live my life and I, I, I go to church once or twice a week. Once, once or twice a week, church-going Christianity is not biblical Christianity. And so this, this is not just about the fact that pastors have to be thinking about, you know, what they're going to be doing on Saturdays and how, how they're... But how is a Christian 
every, every Christian in the church, what part do they have to play? Yes, they may go to their job. Yes, they may, one of their primary involvements in the church may be they go over here and they have a good job and they make good money and they're, they're really giving. You know what? God get, has given somebody a gift of giving and they're really faithful on that. Again, I have every reason to believe a guy that's being faithful, God will give him more because it'll be given to you, pressed down, shaken together and overflowing. A guy that's really, the, 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 guy that, the guy that goes off to his job every day and, you know, he makes it 50% of the time to the prayer meeting and he comes on Sunday 90% of the time. And that's pretty much his Christianity. That's pretty much his involvement. That's pretty much what he does with his life. Other than that, what's he doing? Well, he's mowing his lawn. He may, hangs out with the kids. He watches TV. He does. I mean, that is not standard biblical Christianity. And so, yeah, the thing is, even here, faithfulness. Well, every, look, one of the things that we see is the Bible doesn't talk about holidays and it doesn't talk about vacations. Does it talk about rest? Yes, there are times we need rest. And can that look like a holiday? Yes. I mean, can we call, can a legitimate rest have the title of holiday or vacation? Yes. But the fact is that the Bible talks about a rest. It doesn't talk about holiday. It doesn't talk about vacations. And it doesn't talk about retirement. And so if we just, for once and for all, get it into our minds that if we're going to be faithful here, that look, they enter into their rest when they die. So one of the things that we ought to do is, okay, this is all out. Now, when we're young, we can do things we can't do when we're old. When we're single, we can do things we can't do when we're married. That's one of the reasons why Paul encourages singleness, because you have an ability to serve the Lord like you don't when you get married. But anyway, for all of us, it needs to be all out. You get married, well, the best way to make marriage work for you is the two of you help each other run faster. Yes, when you have children, does that complicate life even more? Does that? Yes. But one of the things God wants us to do with the children that single people don't have to worry about or married people without children is you need to be pouring into the children. So time to teach them, time to, you know, you want to spend time with them. You need to train them and mold them and, and uh, impart to them. But I mean, we need to look at this. We only get one chance at life. Jesus says, well done, good and faithful servant. What did they do? They, they were faithful servants. They took what he gave them and they invested it. And you know what? Being faithful doesn't mean trying to be faithful with another man's gifts or another man's abilities. It means being faithful with what you have. Some people say just, oh, I can't be faithful. Why can't you be faithful? Well, I wasn't called to preach like Spurgeon. No, you what he... If he's given you two talents and he's given that other guy five or ten talents, don't worry about it. The two you have is what you're responsible to use. He's not going to hold you responsible for what Spurgeon had or Lloyd-Jones had or MacArthur has. He's going to hold you responsible for what you have. And so if you, what's, how's it going to look responsible? Well, you know, it, it will it will come out to be, are, are you being faithful with the money he's given you? Are you being faithful with the time he's given you? Are you faithful with the strength he's given you? Some people he doesn't give good health to. And you know what? You, you know, some people are like uh, Gainer, gone through it. Hopefully she's coming out of that. Hopefully that won't be. Tim Jones, you know, there's a problem with his feet. Sometimes you get stuck in situations where your faithfulness is going to be can you be faithful? Amy Carmichael, she her health deteriorated in her last year. She was in bed almost the whole time. That she they said she she prayed almost nonstop. And and we have different gifts. We have different inclinations. We have different passions that God has given to us. Different burdens. Different desires. Different uh, different vision. Some people really have a burden for a certain thing, and uh, you know they. They, they may really have a desire to succeed in the business world, and they're trying to be a saver of Christ. They're trying to share Christ out there in the corporate Britain. And at the same time, they're making money, and they're trying to be really 
sacrificial givers to the cause of the spread of the gospel and God's servants and missionaries and, and widows and orphans. And they're, they're really pouring themselves out for that. You know, just everybody has, to, everybody is going to have to stand accountable for what has been given to him. And so you guys, it, it, it's not just a general rule here about what faithfulness looks like. If you, there are some guys that try to be faithful with what they don't have. I mean, they're, they're trying to do something that God just didn't call them to do. He didn't gift them to do. And so whenever they do it, there really isn't great fruit. And, uh, you know, we just have to, we all have, what faithfulness in your life looks like right now may not be what faithfulness looks like five years from now, because, you know, you may be single right now. And so with singleness, you have much more liberty, much more freedom, much more ability to use the finances you have in very singular fashion. Does, does God want you to, I mean, you're worse than an infidel if you don't take care of your family. And so, you know, you need to take care of your family. A guy needs to love his wife. A guy needs to love his children. And so at every chapter in your life where things may change, things may alter, a man loses his job. Well, can he still be faithful? Yes, he can be faithful. What would faithfulness look like then? Well, faithfulness then might look like, you know, he's really pursuing finding another job. Faithfulness then, you know, somebody could say, well, you're not being faithful. You don't have a job right now. Why aren't you at the church mowing the lawn? Well, I'm trying to find another job. I mean, but, and, and you know, we have to, we all have 24 hours in a day. We all have seven days in a week. We all have the same amount of time. Isn't it amazing how some guys, it's just like, man, they accomplish so much. Why? Because they're go-getters. You know, you can say the, the, the early bird gets the worm. I can remember, you know, when I was lost, it was like I, I had two friends that specifically stick out to me. One, one, uh, my, my friend Marty Albar, it was like, I, didn't, I mean, I can remember him. I, I can remember him in my drafting class and he was, he was talking to the, uh, the teacher. He said, you know, can I go? Can I leave class early? I've got an interview down here at this place. And I remember him running it was before we all had cars. He ran across that school lawn because he was heading on down. He wasn't missing the opportunity and he got the job and he was making money. And so out of all my friends, he was innovate. He was the first guy to have a moped. You could have a moped and be licensed for one when you were 15. And there he goes. And when he turned 16, then he has a car. Why? Because he had this job and he, he was, it's like he was always you know, he was, he was, I was a go-getter. And then I remember, you know, a guy that moved to my school my senior year. And then I went to, I went to college with him and we were both in the mechanical engineering program at the same time. It was like, this guy, he goes to college and it, you know, even when it came to buying beer, I bought beer at the corner store. I bought beer wherever the local place was. He bought beer at Costco. It's like he was always, you know, he was, he got into college and he, and he bought a house and he filled it with a bunch of college guys who basically paid his mortgage. And, and, and so by the time he was done with college, he had this house and he sold it to his brother and he bought another house. And it's like, you know, it's, it's just some people some people are just, they're on the ball. Yeah, but would you not say that that's also kind of a gift? It is. There, there is a giftedness there. But, but there's also, um, you know, there, there can also be an aspect of just diligence. Yeah. I mean, because, because could I look at these guys and say, well, if they can do that, I can do that. But did I have the ambition to be down there looking for a job like the guy in high school? Did I have the ambition? I mean, when I heard that Dave was buying his beer at Costco, could I have gone and got? Yeah, I could have. But it's like, I was more concerned about living for the weekend than I was about 
actually having a house. I just, yes, there's gift in it, but there's also, there's also the diligence thing. It's like when God saved me, suddenly, all of a sudden, I began to recognize just wisdom. Like I was just without wisdom. I was really stupid when I was lost. I did stupid things, lots of waste. But, so, so back to what Abed was saying, you know, you know, how can a person who maybe sees that he lacks faithfulness in his life uh, build faithfulness and that kind of thing from a very kind of secular perspective? Because you, you, you were just describing people who were, we would consider faithful, even though, you know, even in a non-Christian setting, right? So they are not believers, but they are faithful in whatever they were doing or they were diligent. Uh, so would you say from a secular perspective, would you encourage, um, especially like younger men or whatever, uh, to take up, for example, sports if they're not like, um, if they're not self-disciplined, if they struggle to get up the, in the morning and that kind of thing, so that that builds character in them and that kind of thing? Or? Perhaps. I mean, we got Joshua involved. We homeschooled him, but we got him involved in sports. And one of the th reasons was just to give him the opportunity to be on team sports and have to work with others and that interaction and then us, you know, as parents giving him instruction and being there at his games and uh, watching how he interacted with the others and, and uh, you know, that's time to talk about pride and how to lose well as well as win well and um but I, I just one of the things is this not being lazy you know the proverb speaks a lot about what young men need and so discipline with regards to women discipline with regards to friends but also discipline with regards to laziness the the proverbs talk a lot about laziness I looked over at the fence of the lazy man, and you know what? It, the thing was broken down. The thing's overgrown with thorns. And so it's, uh, it, you know, for I, I think Jordan Peterson is, is exactly right. And even though he's coming from a secular bent, but if a guy can just figure out how to get out of bed on time, how to, how to get up, how to, uh, how to keep his own room in order, just to start to get that kind of discipline in his life, you know, if, if, uh, it, it, I would just ask this, is there a connection to having a guy drive up and I, I climb in his car and there's just garbage everywhere and he's got kids and he never cleans it and their half eaten food is between all the seats and it's everywhere. And this car is just an atrocity. Let me ask you something. Is there a connection between that and his ability to manage God's people? Or is there no connection? Well, I think if you, if you flip it and you, and you, and you knew someone was, was a pastor and then you got in their car and it was in a horrendous state, you would think, why, why is that happening? Like, what's going on there for that to happen? Like, it would bring questions in your mind whether you like to admit it or not. So, yes, it would. there would be a connection. There would be something that's... Well, one of the there's, connections... There's, there's a, obviously, there's, there's an issue with, un, un, like, with, with mess and a messy... If, if you, you, for example, your home, you spend probably most of your time in your house. So if your house is messy, then it's probably likely that there's other areas of your life that are messy, that are more internal. I mean, generally speaking, in a worldly sense, when, for example, social services, when they go to a home and they look at a house and it's it, this, it's it's a huge state of the weeds to took over the whole house and, you know, the the windows are filthy and all that and everything is just a state, then they, 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 it, they, they can then, they use that as a stepping stone to this, some bigger issues there. So, yeah. Well, there are connections. I mean, if, if, if a man allows, you know, some, some part of his life to be massively out of order, then it, 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 one of the things that you would have an expectation is that if you have a man 
who sees things that are wrong or sees things that are messy or sees things that are out of order, who has a bent to put them in order, to make things in his life right. Um, see, I make a connection with laziness. Because in, in the same way that a guy's car looks like that is the same reason that the guy's wall looks like that. Why does his wall look like that? Because he's not out here repairing it. He's not out here with a machete hacking all the thorns back. He's not out here. He, you know, one of the f things that you find is if a man is diligent, he rises at a decent time, he's diligent, he doesn't just pilfer away too much time. I mean, he, he rests when it's appropriate to rest, but he's really diligent. It's amazing how much you can accomplish in a day if you're diligent. And you know, men who have projects, and it's like, I got to get to that, I got to get to that. He's a man that plans. He's a man that's that's got forethought, foresight. He's thinking through things. How can I do this? How can I do this? Today, I've got these eight things that I'd like to do. And you know, he might only get to six, but he's he's thinking. He's got a program. He's moving somewhere. He's he's a man that's thinking, I, 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 I'm going to do this. And he does that. And, you know, if a, if a man basically has all these things that are messed up in his life and he can like walk in the midst of them oblivious, then guess what? When the church has a mess in its midst, what's to make me think that that man isn't going to walk through there just oblivious? If, if a man allows his fence to be like that or allows his car to be like that, then what does that tell me? It's kind of like the principle that I tried to instill in young people with regards to cars. I would tell them, look, the greatest amount of depreciation on a car happens in the first four years. When does it make most sense to buy a car? After it's four years old. Why? Greatest amount of depreciation and you've got four years of history. We know after four years whether that car is a dependable model or not. And what I would tell them is this. Don't meet. You guys, I don't know how much you do this. There's a lot of private car sales in the U.S. Lots. And so I would tell people, buy private. Don't go to a used car dealer. All they're going to do is be a middleman and mark it up. You want the best deal on a car? Go buy it firsthand. Don't meet the guy in the grocery store parking lot. Go to his house. Why? As if you go to his house and there's oil stains all over the driveway, well, where'd those oil stains come from? If you go to his house and his house is a wreck, guess how he took care of that car? Is there a connection? If I go to his house and he's got the car sitting out front, his driveway is spotless, his garage doors open, and everything is meticulously in order, guess how well he took care of that car? Guess how often he changed the spark plugs and changed the oil, changed the oil filter, vacuumed it. Guess, guess how well he took care of it. But you know what? If the guy doesn't want me to see where he lives, I look in the car and there's stains like right here, like he dropped his beer on the seats. And, you know, I, I'm not, I want to see the, I want to see the guy's house. And uh, anyway, is there a connection? There's a huge connection. I mean, there's a huge connection. If I got, if, if the guy has all of his front bushes and they are just beautiful and his house is beautiful, the gutters aren't hanging down and the, the shutters falling off and every, everything looks good. Well, then I know I have a really good idea. You know, he tells me my daughter drove this car to college and now she's graduated and, you know, she just wanted a nicer car. And um, so we're selling it. Okay. Yeah. And I change the oil on it all the time. Did you, did you take it somewhere? No, I did it myself. And you know, you look in his garage and you see, yeah, he's got the tools in there to do it. And he's got the oil in there and you see it. And this wasn't the car, he, but is there a connection? There is a connection. And see, that's the kind of thing that we need to see about our life. There's a connection. There's a connection all the way through. We're all the guys that have the same amount of time and we have certain, uh, we all have priorities and it's, you're looking for that. 
You're looking for, because faithfulness, remember, the guys that Paul was saying he couldn't depend on, they weren't necessarily even lazy guys, but their priorities were different. See, Timothy's priority was the people of God. Over here, these guys serve their own thing. Ouch. And you can be really diligent, but what's the priority? See, we want to be diligent and we want our priorities to be right. And how are your priorities going to be right? Well, think about all the things you can do with your life and you need to be running them through the filter of scripture. Like, what do I know? Like for me, I know this, that what does God want me to do? Well, God, like at this point in my life, God wants me to love my wife. God wants me, I believe with the open door, Josh and Tia coming, that that is a responsibility that I have right now. And so I'm wanting to see Joshua get involved in all these different things, the kind of things that I think will prepare him for what it seems like God may be preparing him for. I'm having a meeting like this with you guys because I want to think about future leaders and my responsibility there. I don't know how long I'll be here. I mean, that's one thing. I don't know how long I'll live, or even if I do live longer than, you know, the years I'm here, I don't know if God may take me away somewhere. I don't know that. But I have a responsibility to this church. When I came here, what was there? I, I want to focus. Evangelism, prayer meeting, good, solid teaching come from the pulpit, fellowship, I want, us, I want to make sure the prayer meetings are full. I want to make sure this church is praying, laying hold on the Lord. I want to make sure that the gospel is going out from us in every way imaginable. I want to see us get into the prisons, get into the different places. I, you know, the, the venture to Poland, the venture to Africa, we're not just indiscriminate. I recognize that if I can get people from the church involved in these things, it changes people's worldviews, changes people's perspective, just about perspective about the the world, about how things are. Um, you know, the larger team went to Eastern Europe. Ah, that isn't so different than than here, but the. The slums of Africa definitely are, and I think the more we can get people into places like that. But I'm thinking, you know, what am I preaching through? What am, what, what am I dealing with at the Tuesday Bible studies? There's rhyme and reason to all this. What am I doing with my time? I get up, I want to get in the Word. I, I get up, oftentimes the first thing I do is grab a coffee and walk the streets and, and go pray. I know I need time with the Lord in prayer. I know I want to try to keep myself. I mean, one of the reasons I've been on this diet thing is just because I want to be healthy. I want to be able to actually, this isn't just some fad. This is that this whole thing came about just because I I was looking at, at Nigeria thinking, oh, I feel rotten after I took that second COVID vaccination, which was tainted with something, I'm absolutely certain. Anyways, I wanted to reset my immune system. I was, really wasn't looking to lose the weight necessarily. But what, you know, I am not about being a bodybuilder, but I'm about trying to be as healthy as I can to, to not feel rotten, to feel good, to as good as I can. Why would you not? We're the temple of the Holy Spirit. We should be taking care of ourselves so that we can accomplish as much. I don't want brain fog. And so... You know, even in my reading, my reading is going to be selective. I can't just read everything under the sun. Is is there time for rest? Yes. You have to try to figure that out. You know, what is the best thing to do? When I've been studying, 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 and, and uh, you know, I need a break. Am I going to pull up something on YouTube and watch it? Well, okay, there's all sorts of stuff that you could watch. Is there, it? you know, what... What really helps me to redeem the time? Um, you know, I'm not saying that all of that's done perfect, but you you have to look. What is it? Where are we going? Where are we headed? What's you know? I I'm thinking this. What what needs to happen? What needs to happen with the college campuses? What needs to happen with the with the prisons? What needs to happen with Leeds University? What why did God bring, open that door? I mean, somebody's asking me to, you know, uh, I'm, I'm being asked right now to, I've just asked to preach 
in Norway next year and this together for the gospel conference. And, you know, Adam wants me to preach in February in Poland. And so, you know, you wrestle through these things. Is, is that something I really should, I mean, is that necessary? Is, is, is that whatever? You're just kind of summing up the whole life. Should I be involved in money-making ventures of some type? Well, no, I don't think that that's my priority in life, I, right? It's just, <clears throat> so but were, were you, sorry, were you always like that, or was it that was that a gradual thing that you kind of learned more and more to do, uh, like kind of redeem the time like that? Well, not until I was a Christian. Well, no, no, I, I mean after you were a Christian. But see, once I became a Christian, you know, one of the first things, ah, I was so into doctrine, and then here's I loved MacArthur, and here he comes, he's. In the evenings when he's on the radio, they're going to do a financial series. Like, financial series? I want to hear about limited atonement and justification. <laughs> and and I, want to, I want to know about the deep things. Let's talk about... Anyway, it's like money. And then after it was over, I realized, oh, wow, that's exactly what I needed. I've been so rotten with my money. And so, you know, just... Um, just moving to Texas and living with John Seitzman and seeing his wisdom and his just decision making in in he's such a businessman so in financial areas of life and um you know I want to be faithful with the money that God has given to me and so I'm I'm I do no little amount of thinking about um you know quite honestly I Money burns holes in my pockets, and I don't necessarily like to have too much around. And I think, I think that's being faithful with it. And I'm not saving up for retirement. And so I, I just I trust God's going to take care of me. And if I invest it well in His bank account, then uh, when I need to draw on it, just like Hudson Taylor, when he was at the end of his life, God gave him a Swiss chateau and took care of him, and he had invested all of his money. And so, I mean, just being faithful. I want to be faithful with money. I want to be faithful with the time. I want to be faithful with this church. I still have connections with the church in San Antonio. But, you know, you say, I think as soon as I got saved, I just recognized, I just, I lived selfishly. And I had not redeemed the time, so suddenly I started thinking what I should be doing with my money. I immediately got involved with um, a fr Friday night Bible study, a Tuesday Youth for Christ um, in like a juvenile home, homes for kids, where I was helping share the gospel, befriending these kids. I got involved with uh, Big Brother, Little Brother program, and I got a little brother out of the inner city of Kalamazoo. Uh, I got involved in some, uh, in a church sports league. But basically, I I got involved with that. I would spend my time um, reading. I can remember watching a football game, and I'm not saying that you can't watch a football game, but I can just remember saying, that's it. I got up, I walked away, no more Detroit Lions. I was going to read on Sunday afternoons. And so, and I, I basically stepped away from watching sports for probably 10 years. And uh, I, for 10 years, I was out of touch with pretty much with television, with movies, with music, with sports. I mean, the whole 90s. I just, I didn't even know what songs were popular. I don't know what movies were popular. I was just... I, I disconnected. I gave my time to prayer. I'd work out a lot, but I listened to a thousand. I mean, here's the thing as a young believer, I'd come home from work and I would work out on my solo flex listening to John MacArthur. Whenever I drive somewhere, listening to John MacArthur, I listened to over a thousand sermons just pouring into me, pouring into me, reading book after book, reading my Bible from end to end. But just trying to think how to invest. I, I was an engineer, so I was going to work every day, but trying to fill the evenings with uh, profitable things. Hey, one last question. You mentioned just in passing, like in your mornings, could you speak a bit more about like 
how you go about your morning? Well, when I worked as an engineer, basically I would try to make it a point to get up and take a shower, get dressed, and sit down and have about 40 minutes in the Word. With prayer, or was that just... Just words? in the Word. And then shoot off to work. At lunch, I might have some chores to do, or I might sit at my desk at work and read. Or I might just drive out and listen to... Uh, Lester Roloff, uh, Corpus Christi, and eat my lunch. Lester and, Roloff? Who's, yeah. Who's that? He's a preacher from Corpus Christi. Anyway, one sat alone beside the highway. <laughs> anyway. Um, <laughs> and so, in the evening when I would come home, Typically, I had work that I wanted to do, now, different things. But a lot of times I was working on the property where we lived. When it got dark, devotions with the kids, and oftentimes at night was when I really sought to pray. Out on the driveway, under the moon, under the stars, that was, that was my... But see, that... When I worked as an engineer, that was basically, and, and, and I was involved with the church, and I was involved in evangelism, and I, we had a Tuesday Bible study, and uh, I was speaking at times, so that had to be fit in there. But now, yeah, a lot of times when I get up in the morning, I want to go pray first, and then you know, I was I tried to have 40 minutes before I went in, and I often tried to get in early, 7.30 or earlier to work, uh, just because I wanted to give my employer more time. But, um, you know, when you're working a secular job, well, you've got a space, you've got to work with that schedule. Now, my schedule is a lot, you know, I have certain things that are scheduled during the week at specific times, but most of my week is not specifically scheduled. And so I can get up when I, I don't set an alarm. I get up when I get up, I shower, I typically go out and pray, and then I dive in the Word. And, you know, I try, I'm... I'm trying to do a, about, on average, seven chapters a day, which takes me through the Bible, you know, two, two to three times. And, uh, and even there, I, it's not like I'm on the McShane Bible reading. I, I just, I, I'm, I often start the year in Genesis, as far as the Old Testament goes, but I, I'm all over the place. And and uh, and I keep I keep a record, so I kind of have an idea about where I've read. If I start getting to this time of the year, and I look and there's a gap like where I have not read, then I may target that. I just want, yeah, I want to be. I just think that's my calling in life is I need to I need to know the Word of God and it needs to be fresh in my mind. And if I'm going to be imparting it to other people, so. Maybe that's related to, to, to the question, but just how do you like when you were work like working in secular employment or just in general? Have you got advice for uh, the balance? Because right now, like we've got obviously twenty four hours a day and and that kind of thing. And then you know when you work in secular employment, especially if your employment is such that you could spend more time in your part of your free time to improve or get better at what you do or learn more, uh, which will eventually lead to either, you know, uh, promotion or whatever, you know, it will just, you'll be better at what you do in your job and therefore better at, you know, in, in terms of your faithfulness to your boss, that kind of thing. And, and then at the same time, you want to use your day, however, for other things, you know, and you want to uh, study the word, you want to invest in your family, you want to do this, that, and the other, like, how do you, um, 
I mean, do you have any kind of advice for that? For Acknowledge that? the Lord in all your ways and he'll direct your path. The fact is, I recognize this. I will not sit in condemnation of other men. I mean, I, I may see other people doing something and I may think, I don't know if that's pleasing the Lord or not, but I, I, what we have to what we have to do is be very careful of judging other people who don't do what we do and don't do it like we do it, because they stand or fall before their Lord. And I would say God has called us all to different lives and different things, and He's wired us all different, and He's gifted us all different, and so. I would just say, you know, a guy needs to look at his motive. If one guy is saying, I want to really excel, because there was a season where I was, it, it was like I was involved in two church plants while I was an engineer, consumed my life. And then all of a sudden, those churches were planted and I drew back to the home church, and now all those responsibilities I had for those two churches were gone. And so I was, when I was there, I was leading prayer meeting, I was preaching twice a week, I was, now I'm back at the home church and I'm not doing those things. And so, Lord, what do you want? Is are, are you taking me towards ministry? Which I didn't really know. I didn't have real certainties about that. And, and there was a point there where I said, well, Lord, if you want me to be an engineer, then I'm going to be the best one I possibly can be. And so I'm going to become a professional engineer. And I actually began the process of becoming a professional engineer, which means you actually have the authority to put official stamps on designs and just makes you much more valuable. And so, but as I began to do that, suddenly we began to have a special prayer meeting out on our balcony, out on my deck, and uh, that turned into a Bible study which turned into grace. And so it, it was apparent. Now, but my thinking was this. If I become the best engineer I possibly can and make as much as I possibly can, I want it to be so that I can give as much as I possibly can. If a guy is saying, you know, what should I be doing with my time? And I want to make as much as I possibly can because I want a swimming pool and I want to drive a Mercedes and I want, you know, we, we all have to be checking. We get one life to live and, and we're living this for the Lord. We're living it for his kingdom and we're living it for his purposes and we're his stewards. And actually when he comes, we have to give an account to him to how we invested the talents he gave us. And so, so what I need to do is just encourage you guys to think that way. You guys are stewards. Whether you have two talents or you have five talents or you have 10 talents, you have to know that he's going to come and he's going to, he's going to take. And in that day, it's all going to be out in the open. If you wasted your time and wasted your money, it's, it's, you know, it's gone. The thing is, we can be genuine believers, but there is kind of a teaching in Scripture that we have to deal with about things being burned up on Judgment Day. And you know what? Guys can even pour themselves into ministry, and Paul says it, they can be saved so as by fire. Listen, what you need to recognize is on Judgment Day, all of our works are going to be put to the torch, and only what is gold and silver and precious stones is going to abide. There's a lot, you know, brothers, we have wood, every one of us have wood, hay, and stubble in our life. Your objective should be to reduce that. I mean, if you're wise, because it's really stupid to have opportunity to invest those talents better and not have done it when we find that our works follow us 
and there is eternal reward and there is the ability to store up treasure in heaven. And it really ought to shame us that Christ says that sons of this generation are wiser than us. That's bad. In other words, they invest in what they're after better than we invest in what we're after. That ought to shame us. And so it really ought to be our objective to try to eliminate the wood, hay, and stubble. And there's not an exact right way to do it. If one guy says, well, Lord, I didn't give myself to perfecting being a computer engineer, being a programmer, being cybersecurity guy, I didn't, I didn't perfect that as well as I could have because making money really wasn't my chief agenda. I, I had such a burden for those prisons and I wanted to get in there and uh, take the gospel to those guys. Okay. I mean, we have a guy, one of the elders at GCC, uh, Jeff Peterson, you know, he's got a full-time job and he does it well. I have every reason to believe he makes good money and he can be a, a, a big giver in the church. I, I have no idea how much he gives. I've never, never looked, never tracked it. I mean, I found, you know, I had access to that information, but I oftentimes just, that, that did not consume me. What people give is between them and the Lord. There's a box back there. You want to put money in it. You don't want to put money in it. I mean, I recognize this. God answered prayer and we always had enough in there to do whatever we wanted. And so it's just between people. But, you know, Jeff also has a profound prison ministry. Back when he lived in Michigan, somebody tried, coerced him into going to a prison. And he said, God got a hold of him. And, and from that time forward, he's just had a burden to be there. Okay, you know, God wires people differently. And so we all have, you know, it's, it's kind of like, well, should I take, should I take a conference in London? Should I take a conference in, in the peak or yeah, the Reformation revival? Should I go to Norway? Should I go to Poland? Should I take these conferences? And as I, you know, I wrestle with that. I wrestle with that. Should I do it? Should I not do it? What's, what are the benefits? What's the theme they want preached on? Having some idea about the reformed world. Could I, could I benefit somebody? Should, should I, should my focus be here? Am I in any way detracting from the responsibility that I believe I have? And th that's been a big thing, even trying to sort out how much responsibility do I have still for grace? How much responsibility do I have for Josh and Tia? How much responsibility do I have to you men? How much responsibility to this church? How much responsibility to the other churches in different places? And but you guys have you guys have the same thing. Even though it's not exactly those things, you guys have the same questions you have to ask yourself. How much responsibility do I have to that, to that, to that, to that? And it's not for me to tell you. You have to say, okay, Lord, if, if, am I, am I, um, I mean, are we doing wrong? Like there's been seasons where it's like, oh, Lord, are we dropping the ball when it comes to abortion? Should, should I be leading the church to do more? Um, are, are we... You know, even Sam Sam says, brother, when are we going to sell everything we have and, and go feed the poor? Okay, well, how much should I how much should I be thinking that I need to be the guy to to be going to to the slums and feeding the poor? How much should I do that? And oftentimes I recognize as a leader, you know, Sam comes along and he and he says, Brother, if you'll use my speakers, I'll leave them. Like, well, he said, brother, you're, you're pastoring the church. You shouldn't let Sonny do all that. You should, you should take, because people are watching you. They're, they're watching to see what you do. Uh, okay, I guess that's right. To Is him, it, yeah, <clears throat> just to kind of like, maybe like with, with your question and like your question is like, like Christ would say, 
was led by the Spirit, and the Spirit drove him into places. And it's the same Spirit that leads our lives. And oftentimes, it's in the moment decision where, you know, it, it, it's like when it's, say, it's nine o'clock at night, and you're not, you're not tired, and you, there's opportunity to do something. There's a bit of free time, and it's like, like for me, for example, one of my weak points is playing chess. It's like, could I play chess? <laughs> oh, do you play against the computer with somebody online? Well, I play online, yeah, with other people. Um, and like, like last night, for example, there was that um, Spirit Without Measure book in front of me, and then there was like chess. And I was like, well, you know, when you're faced with that decision, like, how am I going to spend my time right now? Like, because you, because you could talk about like, you know, like your routine, like how can you get a bit, but like, even just in the moment of like, right, I've got, an, I've got an hour now. What, what do I do with it? And the spirit's almost like pressing on you to read the word or maybe go to Ephesians or, you know, go and read one John all the way through. And, and it's, and he, he's, he's, and it's like, how you respond in that moment often that we fail where we're like, yeah, I, you know, I could do that or I, I could play some chess or I could message someone on Facebook or I could. Can the spirit uh, tell you to play chess though? No, no, well, 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 <laughs> but th this is, this is, a, it, it seems to me that the spirit's in the business of, of, of going about spiritual things, spiritual things. And, 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 and I, and I know you, <laughs> and, 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 and you know what, like, praise God, he has given, I mean, like, I think chess is a great game, like, it's a genius game, the strategy behind it, the, the way it all falls into place and how it works as a game, right, the, like, I, I find that interesting, but I'm more and more coming to, like, realisation of, like, yeah, it's great, but does that mean, should you be playing it as much as you play it, like, instead But that's of, a good question. Yeah. Would the spirit now now see here's the thing a dad's busy and his son is saying, Dad, come play chess with me. And you see, you could you could feel the spirit prompting you, you need to go do that. Whereas if you go do that and it's really got nothing to do with your family, I mean, I'm not gonna say that they're there might not be a mind sharpening aspect to it. Um, and I'm, and you know what? It's one of those things where you could say, well, all things are lawful for me, but not everything builds up. Not everything is necessarily expedient. And I'm not going to be, and I'm not going to be captured by the power of this thing. See, a man could actually feel the spirit burdening him to go watch sports. Again, if his son's saying, Dad, come watch sports. I, the spirit could move upon a man to go watch a movie if his wife is saying, look, we haven't had time together and come watch this with me. And you see, it, it all has to do with what am I actually accomplishing? Because I recognize this. There can be a big difference between Okay, coming and sitting down with my wife and watching Sue Thomas. You know what that is? <laughs> Probably some like series of like seventeenth century. A supposedly religions. Christian woman who's deaf and worked for the F <laughs> FBI. Anyway. <laughs> aside from that. But but the fact is, you see, there'd be one thing if I watched four episodes of that on my computer yeah. in the middle of the afternoon yeah. and coming out here and watching one with my wife. You see, there's a difference there. And what you're, what you're asking is, what am I accomplishing by this? And so, yeah, it's, it, it's even like sports. Like, you know, you can, you can realize where, well, you know, if if it would interest Joshua when he was younger, sit down and watch some sports together. So there were a lot of things you couldn't keep Joshua in the, like a lot of these girly things. You know, I had three daughters. 
and a wife, of course, and they loved these girly things. And when they'd come up, Joshua would watch for five minutes and he'd be gone. Yeah. Last thing we want is Joshua disappearing into there. So yeah. watching something with action or watching some kind of sports that would capture his attention was desirable in order to keep us as a family together. And But you have to be thinking about all that stuff. Yeah, I think yeah, that, that is yeah, what you're talking about, just about like, it's like, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be wrong in the spirit, maybe you do, but to, to do it just by yourself and, and it, you're just using this time. And it's, it's, and when I picked up, you know, Spirit Without Measure and I start reading it and I read that, you know, whatever second and third chapter, I'm like, I'm just, wow, this is amazing. This is great. Like, I feel like my, like I'm getting, like I'm, I'm having big thoughts of Christ. And it's like, you can't ever regret doing something that makes you have bigger thoughts of Christ. No, you know that there's some things that if, like, like okay, if I listen to this R.C. Sproul sermon versus, you know what you can do on YouTube? It just can be endless dribble. And an hour goes by and it's like, yeah. You know, and if, especially if you did that right before you went to bed. Now, you, what's your mind thinking on? Versus if you listen to that and then you're laying there and you're thinking, you're thinking about Christ and, you know, is your mind set on things above? Yes. And you basically did the things to get it to be set on things above. You know, the thing about chess, I know chess. There's strategies. If you study games, if you study strategy, if you study... If you simply study opening moves, like the first six moves you make in chess, a guy who knows how to start the game can win a lot. But, that, but that's a sermon illustration right there. So, for example, you could do that in order to, um, you know, just be better equipped for other aspects. Well, but the thing is this. You really have to ask, you know, Am I redeeming the time? I would say, you know, if a guy's wiped out, see some some guys do, some guys do work all day that's really physically taxing. Other guys do mentally taxing work. Well, you know, if a guy just if a guy is looking for some kind of mental stimulation. Based on what he just needs some relaxation, we just have to ask ourselves: Am I? I mean, is this being profitable? Is this being helpful? I mean, I have to ask myself that. Do I like sports? I do. U.S. sports. I mean, I don't sit and watch games, but I like highlights. And uh, and there's a guy that in in Utah that works on cars. And I, what's he called? Fab Rats. If I could have my own garage and work on cars all day, or if I could be a gardener and work in the garden all day, I I could do that. And so you know, watching this guy do this is, he puts out a video, different lengths and size. It can be. 10 minutes, it can be 20 minutes. But he, he puts out a video two, three times a week. Yeah, and I typically watch those. And, uh, you know, Leonard Ravenhill loved John Wayne movies. But Charles Leiter told me that he also was a man who would pray 12 hours a day. Prayed 12 hours a day, he loved John Wayne movies. Well, can you do that? Like you're saying no. He he did that. I know, I know, but I'm just shaking my head and thinking, how did he do that? Like, well, but see, the thing is, when he used to say to me, he was like, you know, you've got 24 hours a day, eight hours you work, and eight hours your family. What what? But he wasn't a pastor. Not everybody can pray 12 hours a day because of their life and responsibilities. But he didn't have that. He wasn't a pastor. He was an itinerant, and. You know, a lot of times he probably didn't have to prepare a whole lot. He knew what he was going to say. 
churches were all messed up and he always had some <laughs> scathing message yeah. for it. I used but, to just see him like walking back and forth for like in the last start, like maybe just what I've seen. Like, um, like with, with, with a Bible there, yeah. he's always just like kind of right. back and forth with a microphone. But he loved John Wayne movies. And you, you know what? Yeah. Ray Comfort said he he feels a hesitation in his soul almost every single time he goes out on the street. He said if he was honest, he would actually be at home watching a Western movie. Can well, I ask, um, I know we're getting on, it's like 12 o'clock now, but in um, regards to faithfulness and burdens, do you think, because um, you, you had a lot from you and, you know, and in, in, in faithful men that you know, like Sam and everything, and it seems like, like Matt Wilton saying, they've got these, they've got these burdens of like just of ministry and reaching people, reaching the lost and taking the gospel. Like, do you think there's a, um, a, a an absolute connection between faithfulness and burdens? Like, the like the more f faithfulness you've got, the more burdens you've got. Because I feel like. I know it's hard to separate like what we're talking about from ourselves. Like, like I don't have like burdens like I want. Yeah, but I don't think you necessarily have to have a burden to be faithful. No, 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 no. I, no, I know, but like, kind of, it seems like all these men who have got burdens are fearful men. Well, because what yeah. burdens do is they drive you. But yeah, so that's... when a man has some idea, but how do you of... get that drive? Like, how do you get that drive to like kind of? Well, I think this, Jesus was a man with drive. He was a God man with drive. He was on the go. He came to do his father's will. And you know, one of the things that we're told is that as we behold the glory of the Lord, we get transformed into the same image. And I would say this, just spending time studying Christ and even reading biographies and autobiographies. One of the things I found through the years is Nothing stirred my soul beyond Scripture and sermons on Scripture than autobiography. Seeing these men made it the same stuff I am and seeing them live those lives and do those things and accomplish so much, that just seeing them live by faith, seeing reading Hudson Taylor, reading Whitfield, reading about these guys' lives, Adoniram Judson, John G. Payton went to the Hebrides, reading all about these missionaries and all their activities and, and, and different, you know, even women, like uh, just, you know, the different ones throughout history that have been so profoundly used. And you know what? They were, they were people who pressed through. They were not easily discouraged, easily defeated. Um, who was a little lady you guys had here in England that went to China, um, took all the kids over the Yellow River when the Japanese attacked during World War II? Oh, yeah. Mary Slate, Slate, Mary uh, Slater. No, no, Slesser. It, no, it was, uh, uh, it's on the tip Did of my tongue. She to be a missionary or something, that lady. Yeah, she got declined by the China Inland Mission. Yeah, what yeah, was her name? The, 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 biog the story of her was called like a thousand mile. Uh, the torchlight, there's a, there's a torchlight on her, isn't there? Yeah. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. She was very well known. Her name's on the tip of my tongue. It'll come any moment. But, but anyway. Um, Gladys hmm? Allward. Gladys, Gladys Allward. Yeah. yeah. But, but I mean, think about Gladys. She got, she got, what was she doing? She was a housekeeper, and she got shot down by the China Inland Mission. And what'd she do? Well, she was determined. She was like Sam trying to get the four wheelers to. She what'd she do? I mean, she basically sailed across the English Channel, and from there she got on trains and she went through Russia and she went through civil war and difficulties and, and, uh, you know, she made it all the way to China and then God used her. And it, anyway, it's yes, burden, but look, I doubt you are burdenless. The thing is, I suspect you have burdens, but sometimes those burdens, look, I would tell people at grace, I can think of one deacon, 
specifically who stands out in my mind. And there's others in the church. They're like, well, you know, sometimes they would say, we're just not sure if this church is the best fit for us. We just don't have the burdens for evangelism and the burdens for for missions that it seems like so many people in the church. But I would say, brother, the part you have to play in this church is essential. Not everybody's going to go. Not everybody's going to be on the streets all the time go, doing door-to-door ministry. We need people that are faithful in their families, faithful in their workplace, that are faithful in the church, that are here making certain that the AC units are running back here and making sure that the, the elements for the Lord's Supper are are coming out at the right time. We need people like that. We need people, wasn't this, that's how the King James said it. While, you know, many of the guys went off to fight the Amalekites, there were the guys that stayed by the stuff. I mean, we need that. We need that. We need the people that are going to keep the home base solid that they're not going to be on the front lines, whether it's locally, whether it's regionally, whether it's on the outermost parts of the world. They're not going to be out on those front lines. We need those stable, dependable, faithful. And see, they don't have to have burdens for the end of the earth, burdens for Gladys Allward, burdens to get to here, there, or the other. But they they just need to be people that... It, it's like the body is made up of different members and not everybody is an eye or an ear or lips or tongue or we got we got a lot of people that are you know your other parts and so the for this thing to operate well we need that it's like brother you say you don't have this that or the other thing but i know this about you you know every prayer meeting you're there Every Sunday morning, you're there. You're, you're making sure this happens and that happens. And if you weren't doing that, well, who's going to do that? I mean, we need you. And then there's those who kept their hands up, you know, Moses, basically, uh, while the, the others were fighting. And then there was those who were keeping his hands up as well. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah. And, and so, I mean, that there's a reality right there. But I, what I would tell people is this. Do not despise the burdens God has given you. Because what I saw is I want to say every single burden that I had, I saw God fulfill. I saw God give open doors to. And I tell people all the time, do not despise your burdens. Even though they may be slow in coming, even though it may seem like God's not hearing you right now, don't don't just dismiss those. Don't just write those off. Because he, you know what? Somebody may have a burden for China, and they may never end up in China, but they may result in them praying for China all the time. You know what? That Christ is going to tell that person, well done. Andy Hamilton was always absolutely convinced that the primary work was done, like there, the primary work was done by Aaron and her up on that mountain holding up the hands of Moses, he was absolutely convinced that one of the primary works of foreign missions is done right in the churches in America when people drop down on their knees on a Wednesday night, plead with the Lord. Or Spurgeon would have been convinced it was their 800 praying people that basically made up the boiler room. And you know, we don't want to despise. We don't want to despise this because it's all essential. And so, you know, one of the one of the big problems is that people can say, "Well, I don't have a burden for all these things that people in the church seem like." And and you know, sometimes people that are involved in evangelism can make the people that aren't involved in it feel bad, feel inferior, feel like they're you know less than. And and sometimes you know. The people that aren't doing those things, they not only feel that, but, you know, there is actually a pressure, like you're somehow not measuring up if you don't do these things. Now, I would want to know from people why they're not doing those things. I mean, if you're not involved in anything, but, uh, you know, different people are wired different. What you, If we're going to be really helpful to one another as we stir up one another to love and good works, well... The way to do that is to seek to recognize what 
the gifts and burdens of the people we're speaking to actually have. Because stirring up somebody to love and good works is not just going to everybody and saying, you need to be in the slums of Africa. And well, that's not it. What you want to do if you're going to really be effective at that is you want to think about what can these people do? What are they comfortable with? I mean, you know, if you want to stir up Olivia, that's going to look different than if you want to stir up Jody. Why? Olivia's ready. She's, she chomps at the bit to be on the street. She loves to be out there. Jody's more reserved. And you have to deal not only, you know, this gift that there's personality involved and there's everything. And you just, you can, if we're really going to try to stir up people to be involved in loving others and being involved in good works, then we want to, we want to be thinking, well, how are these people wired? What can they do? Get them. We want to get people to start and then build from there. There's always a starting place. So then, so then going into that, you, you, we need to actually know the people. Uh, exactly. And not just like a group of people within the church, but like uh, attempt to know everyone. Right. You're going to have a hard time stirring up people to love and good works if you don't know them. It almost goes hand in hand with you you're finding out who they are where their strengths are yeah that's really uh, helpful what really is helpful about what you said there the last 10 minutes about burdens and faithfulness and thanks there. well now to leonard verdine <laughs> <laughs> No, okay. Really, I'm glad. I'm glad we had this morning, like about. Yeah, yeah. We're go we're gonna break it up like this because you know just going through this book chapter after chapter. Yeah, it's got a certain flavor to it, and it's and it's good. It's good. There's a reason I'm wanting to go through it, but anyway, we're gonna mix it up with some other things because these things are essential. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, just one last question in terms of. Um, <coughs> Uh, what you do now and what you did when you were working, uh, you mentioned like going out in the driveway preparing stuff. And I remember in the past you mentioned like a couple of times a week you'd go for walks and stuff. Is that even back then, was that like a regular practice? Is there a point? Where no, that was a regular practice on my driveway there. Once we moved into town and I no longer was doing engineering, um, I often walked the fields across from my house. But then I found this place called Brackenridge, and uh, that was like often I would drive over there, and it was easy to spend 40 minutes in prayer just walking the San Antonio River over there. And of course, San Antonio just gets so unbearably hot. So running over there in the morning and having the shade of the trees along the river um, was just a really nice place. Rarely did I, it was just a nice place to be in the very center of the city, be in the woods and not see many people. Now the golf course was to my left and there were always people out there, but you know, we were kind of isolated. They're playing their game and there's a fence between us and I, I was kind of off next to the river. It's interesting how like we have different preferences when it comes to praying. You know, some people like to put their head like in the Bible. Some people will literally get inside of a cupboard. You know, some people will uh, just, you know, kneel on the bed. I, you know, some like yourself, you like to kind of go for a walk. Um, I, I, I also like uh, prayer walks, but I just find as long as I've got, for me personally, I've been like, like as long as I've got a bit, of, like I like to look at the sky <laughs> as mad as that sounds, I'm not worshiping the sky or praying the sky, but it's almost like looking up to the sky, looking up to the night sky. Maybe, you know, when I consider them things, it, it I guess, helps me, you know. But, oh, I find that, especially if you're... Uh, if you can be out in the country where you actually can don't have city light dimming all the stars, it can be very, it can be glorious.
Well, thank you. Okay, gentlemen, let's pray. Father, we thank you for the time together. Pray that it would be profitable, not easily forgotten by any of us. Bring it to our remembrance when we need it, as we need it. Lord, help us to redeem the time. We know our lives are short. Help us to number our days. We pray this in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.